Webhub, is it okay to ask? Uh, so I, I, I was reading something. Sorry. Okay, okay they are starting. So no. Okay. 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 Good afternoon, esteemed guests, lovely members of the virtual audience, and welcome to Orange City Literature Fest 2020. The section will be of 40 minutes, and the topic is historical fiction, a sneak peek into the past. For this amazing session, we have guests. We have our guests. First, Ma'am Nandini Sen Gupta, a Pondicherry-based journalist and writer who has several fiction and non-fiction to her title. Her first historical fiction title for young readers was the story of Kalidas. The gem amongst poets hit the stands last December and her next book will debut this November. Currently, she is uh, researching medieval India for a narrative of historical non-fiction book for Penguin India. Welcome, ma'am. Our second guest is uh, Ma'am Parvati Sharma, a Delhi-based author. Her debut was a collection of sto short stories called The Dead Camel and Other Love, Other Stories of Love. She also has a novel written, Close to Home, two books for children. Story of Bauer and Rattu and Puri's Adventure in History, 1957, and a historical biography. Jahangir, an intimate portrait of the great Mughal publisher. Welcome, ma'am. Next, we have Mopia Basu, who has worked as a journalist in, with various esteemed newspapers and has written a variety of topics. Her debut book, Toka, was published in 2015. Her books, The Queen's Last Salute and Anarkali and Selim, a retelling of Mughal Azam, were bestsellers. Mopia believes that objectives of historic fiction writer should be to bring alive certain aspects of history and not change it, to present and enhance what's there and pull it out from the layers of obscurity. We welcome you, ma'am. Our next guest is Sir Weber Purandare. He began his journalistic career with the political magazine Blitz in 1993. He has since worked with India's leading newspapers, such as the Indian Express, the Asian Age, Daily News Analysis. And apart from that, he has written for a host of other publications. His first book, The Sena Story, was published in the year 1999, when he was only 23. His second book, Sachin Tendulkar, a definitive biography, is now into its fifth edition. He is currently a senior associate editor with the Hindustan Times, Mumbai. We are deeply privileged to have all of our guests in this panel today. This panel will be moderated by none other than Sir Naveen Chaudhary, who is the author, who is an author and subscriber. His political thriller, Janta Store, is soon going to be adapted into a web series. He works as an associate marketing director at Oxford University Press and leads social science discipline marketing globally. Now, I hand it over to you, Sir Naveen. Spotlight is all yours. Thank you, Anishi, and uh, welcome everyone, all the panelists. So I'm author, I'm first a marketer and uh, surrounded by so many journalists, I'm a bit scared. So, but at the same time, I think journalists are one who actually give you insights of a lot of things. And today when we are talking about historical fiction, so history is something which where I selected the class, but fiction is something which always excited me. So today uh, we're talking about historical fiction, which is, which is a very interesting topic. I sneak peek into past. So we are not going that much into past. We are trying to understand from these authors how they see historical fiction and what are the areas what are the topics which, how they select a topic different aspects of it and the interesting part of this panel is everyone is not just a fiction writer we have webhau who wrote non-fiction and uh, not just such a and savarkar bal thakre so a lot of things so we have different perspective so let me start nandini with you i was going through one of your interview and i read uh, that you visited some place and then you started researching and then found that you should you got inclined more to historical fiction normally what happens with the kind of uh, profession we are being a journalist you have access to different kind of topic and a lot of things you can write so what really made you into historical fiction how you moved into this side 
Thank you so much, Naveen. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that it is an absolute honor to be um, on this platform and uh, sharing this platform with such esteemed uh, speakers. Um, you know, my journey into historical picture, general and history in particular, began uh, with a uh, with a weekend holiday. My husband and I we we took a weekend break about 10, 12 years ago, and uh, we decided to go to Aurangabad, to Ajanta Ilora. And at that point, you know, I'd, I'd just like to say that I'm not a student of history. Uh, I did I read English literature in college, and, and by profession, I'm a journalist. I'm a, I'm a hack. Uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, but when I went to uh, Ajanta, and I saw those pictures, and I looked at those people, and, and it left me absolutely, you know, to use a very American term, gobsmacked. Uh, I sort of looked at them, you know, men and women, uh, just, just like me. They, they looked at us, you know, uh, and they were wearing some really exotic and some exotic clothes. And, and I wonder, I said, you know, who are these people? Uh, how come we don't really read about them when we are in school? Like you, you know, when I used to be in school, I used to find history terribly boring. Uh, so, you know, I suddenly wonder that there's, there's a lot about my past, my heritage that I didn't know anything about. And, and when I came back, I quickly Googled, like all good journalists, and came across uh, and this historian uh, called Walter Swink and, and asked him, and, and he was so surprised, you know, he said, but this is your heritage. Why don't you know anything about it, you know? And, and that sort of started off, and for the next 10 years, I just read history for fun. And the more I read history, the more I realized that what they don't tell you in classrooms is that history is about the story. Uh, his story, her story, our story, and uh, now in my new book, their story. You know, the story of animals as well. Right. Um, that's, what, that's what my journey has been. <laughs> So this is 5,000 years plus history, a uh, lot about historical characters, different time periods, and uh, uh, different uh, kind of incidents. So how actually you filter out what kind of thing you want to put in your fiction and how you want to connect it so that it can connect with the audience. And there are different kind of periods. So is there any specific period which is very much close to you through which that you actually... Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a very nice question, actually. So when I started out, I I have been for a, for a long, long time, uh, although I'm here in the 21st century, effectively, I've been living in the past. Um, and my husband, my late husband, used to joke that uh, there are there are two people in our marriage, he, me, and Devraj Chandragupta Vikramaditya, who was a hero of my first novel, The King with him. So uh, I find ancient India fascinating. I've uh, researched both third, fourth, and fifth century India for 10 years. Um, but, you know, off late for the, for the Blue Horse, for my new book, as well as for the book that I have now been commissioned, which I'm working on, of Penguin, uh, I'm looking at medieval India as well. So I find that there are so many hidden gems, uh, you know, hiding, you know, in, in our past. And while I, I find ancient India still very, very captivating, particularly because we were such a, such a glorious uh, people, our, our, our society, um, economically, culturally, uh, in terms of literature, in, in every respect, art, architecture, uh, we had reached a pinnacle. So in a sense, uh, if, if that was the first spring, then medieval India is probably the second mm -hmm. spring. So that, you know, there's a lot to discover. Uh, my yeah. first love uh, will always be ancient India, but now I'm discovering a new love as I, as I begin my research, my new love. Medieval. Yeah. Great, thank you, Nandini. Uh, Mopia, coming to uh, this point, when which uh, continuing the question which I asked uh, Nandini. Uh, so your book is on Lakshmi Bai, and I read one of your interviews where you watched Manika Nika, Thanks of Hindustan. You discussed about the movie, and for me, a lot of historical fiction which came into movies, they always become a lot 
controversial and always accused of misrepresentation of facts when we are talking about fiction it is something where you are taking historical plot or the time period or sometimes character like nandi is taking vikram so how how you actually work out how you weave the story uh, so that you ensure that there is no misrepresentation of facts that is not if uh, negatively impacting any character at the same time your fiction your story the story which you are weaving is coming out in an interesting way okay like as we were talking a little while ago yeah uh, you know making a movie on history on historical characters is vastly different from writing a book i mean i don't know with us would you know uh, we are writers so i i wouldn't really go with the filmmakers because i have been truly disappointed whenever i've gone to watch a historical especially our you know in our cinema indian cinema especially a bollywood cinema so i will not really like to get into that space navin because uh, i'm not really equipped to talk about uh, film spell making and how um, how much they really stick uh, to the uh, you know, how authentic they are how much they stick to facts because again it differs from director to director there are some directors like mr benegal uh, you know for instance sham benegal uh, some of his historical um, films are pretty pretty much uh, you know authentic pretty pretty much sticking to facts but uh, i would rather talk about uh, writing historical fiction uh, first of all the moment the premise is a book the moment you're writing for a book uh, the research widens i mean you you tend to get into uh, you tend to start researching much more uh, but there is always uh, you have to be uh, very clear uh, as to what you are reproducing so not everything that is chronicle of contemporary historians is correct because they like i said they had their own agenda you know the official chroniclers of certain dynasties of certain kings empires so like for instance uh, the akbar nama like a lot of us here are writing on medieval uh, my next book is also the one person commission is also on medieval india parvati is written on medieval india and other people are writing so um, we all know we are all we all refer to say for instance the akbar nama akbar nama was um i mean i i don't know of course it was a very vivid description of the times then but it was also like a homage paid to akbar mm -hmm. because it was commissioned by akbar so it depends on um from chronicler to chronicler so sometimes foreign travelers they had their own viewpoint they gave a very different perspective uh, official chroniclers gave a very different perspective in fact my next book would be uh, uh, you know exploring uh, a controversial um, love story, historical love story so controversies abound are our historical space so we have to be very clear what we are taking out what we are coming you know out from that huge uh, vast canvas that we are dealing with well. i think there's a problem with the audio there's a lot of disturbance uh, from the disturbance which i'm also feeling yeah so uh, uh like historical fiction you can take certain creative liberties which is not the case with uh, non fiction so you weave in characters incidents events keeping the backdrop keeping the historical calendar you know very much in perspective you can't mess with uh, the dates you can't mess with certain historical major events which change the course of history what you can perhaps change enhance or you know dramatize for effect it is the story so that is the uh, advantage fiction writers have so historical fiction writers have over non fiction writers i think parvati and webber would be better able to throw light on that nandini and i i think nandini would agree with this that fiction writers have a certain advantage over non fiction writers because we can play around with the characters like i said not with events not with major historical not with the date line but we can play around with the characters we can enhance we can dramatize that is the advantage fiction writers have over non fiction writers who have to really stick to the hard facts so so i i think they'll be able better be able to answer uh, definitely uh, so i think uh, 
So I had similar kind of thought from Vaibhav, but before that, I want to check with Parvati and then I will go to Vaibhav. Parvati, uh, what you have wrote is about the children. So this is not uh, fiction, but it is written in a different way. You have set up some fictional characters through which you are telling story and the books are very much written for the children. Uh, coming to this point, uh, I, I want to understand from your side children who sleep in history class. So that is the most common joke that we see. So how, how do you think uh, this can be made very interesting for the children in the history class? The way you are writing, why that kind of thing cannot be adapted into the schools, into the curriculum? Why curriculum need to be so boring? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Naveen. And uh, I thank you, uh, thank you Festival for inviting me. And, uh, I, I just want to say that uh, I write both uh, historical non fiction and fiction fiction. I write for children, but maybe not so much. Uh, there are certainly not fiction characters, but there are historical characters. Uh, it's not fiction, but maybe it's more just introduction to these people. You know? So, in one sense, in one book, I did some kind of introduction to. Uh, our book was Mughals, and then the other book, uh, uh, more recently, I've written about some of the people who were part of the 1857 uh, rising against the East India Company. So, uh, so just, just having that, I, I think what you're saying is that I think you know, I only sold it, and uh, even now when I go to schools and those schools and things. Uh, the thing is, uh, there are two subjects that are very much maligned in schools and amongst children. There is history and there is which are both, everyone is very scared of approaching and providing much as possible. Uh, and I think it's very similar because both are not in abstraction. So you learn that the formula is, you know, only square to be square, so whatever, you know, who knows what that means. Or you learn certain things, you know, you learn certain things. Seven, fifteen, twenty-six, uh, whatever. All these groups and names from dialects, from that, that is what you need. It has no application to your, uh, to your life. Read history. You start to uh, uh, sort of read it, not in that short. You realize exactly what I think. Saying that these stories and stories are simply a people. Uh, to all of us as adults, but also, of course, uh, of course, uh, to children. And so, therefore, then that is that has been my attempt in writing for children to say history in verbal, political, and accessible by telling stories and by presenting stories as you know, human beings in the sense of uh, not just with the flaws, tendencies, all of that, but uh, relatable in, in, in small ways, you know, like, um, like for example, you can think of Babur in, in one different, different way, but uh, when of course, you know, especially when you're reading about Babur now, I definitely I think when you about 11 years old, you look at Babur, you're a child, actually. And one of the things you remember about your father, like, I think your father was actually a very really holy man. And uh, after he had had uh, two drinks or dinner or whatever, he was laughing and he was with the laces of the table would pop open, you know. And you can imagine this kid watching his grandfather uh, uh, laughing and his buttons flying open. And that sort of detail uh, can see somebody alive. Or, uh, you know, when, you, uh, when in writing about 1857, there was first uh, Rani Lakshmi and there are many, many things uh, about her that we know. But one of the details that really uh, struck me was that, you know, in her final in her practice, uh, she wore this first necklace. You know, and it's there's something so uh, sort of uh, human and real and also moving about that. This was, she was sort of fighting this battle, but also she was. A young woman wearing her, uh, you know, wearing her pearls, There's, and so, so these kind of things in these works that you sort of, uh, or you know, even in, in, uh, in also in the 1857, there's 
Bahadır Şahzatör bu, bu seçim günde Yamuna Devi var. Ama öte taraftaki de ne de son sorun bir şey var. Ama öte taraftaki de ne de son sorun bir şey var. Ama öte taraftaki de ne de son sorun bir şey var. And the other thing is disability. You know, history is not uh, something that is uh, remote from us, so that has to be uh, told to us from about, you know, coming uh, sort of uh, from the top down. That is something that we can all access, the material is there, sources are there, we can read and find out for ourselves. So that, uh, so that in order to try, to try and progress, uh, history can be enjoyed without getting because you know what one of the paradoxes is at the same time that some kind of history is considered so boring and people are going to sleep in their classes at another level and especially recently it's going to come to such a hugely emotive uh issue that sort of coming to war on the subject of what happened 500 600 uh years ago so 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 to go from the in between you know to not something and not be warring but to access uh and do what we like and and you can enjoy it and you can act on it and uh, and see it as something that is as accessible and fair for all of for all of us that's the hope for you. i think i think you're on mute uh Nadine. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. so just uh, thank you, thank you, Parvati. And uh, OCRF team just wanted to tell you there was some kind of disturbance in the audio which we all felt. Uh, still, there I was still here, some disturbance. Still, there is something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now I am able to get a lot of things from Parvati. Uh, Parvati, Parvati shared that a lot. The way story is told, that way if we share a story that made it in interesting and similarly for writing a non-fiction or a biography i think that is something which you do a uh, lot of authors non-fiction uh, writers or biography writers they do that but at the same time what mopia was saying or uh, nandini they can play with their characters but that is not the liberty with a writer who is writing a biography if you're writing something about bal Thakre or savarkar you don't have that liberty but my experience about reading biographies are I, I always felt that whenever someone is writing a biography they do write about negative side positive side but somewhere they fell in love with that character and they get very much softened on uh, the negative side of that character does it happen with everyone or it is just what 10 15 books i read it happened just there so does it happen with you also <laughs> Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, firstly, I'm not a historical fiction writer, like uh, Maupia and Nandini are historical fiction writers. Parvati has written both historical fiction and non-fiction. Uh, so I'm a non-fiction writer, like you correctly said. And uh, what I feel is that as a biographer, uh, one has to constantly make an effort to keep a distance from the subject. Now you will inevitably start getting closer and closer to the subject the more you look into a subject. That is that is unavoidable. So you have to make a conscious effort to step back and to look at things a little more objectively and from a distance and to ensure that there is some sort of balance. Uh, now some biographers do fall into the trap of uh, getting too sympathetic about the subject. Uh, some biographers set out to write a sympathetic work. And there are some who are seeking the truth. You know, I, I believe that the job of a biographer is to seek the truth. Does that mean that uh, you do not take a position? No, that does not mean that. You can take a position, but at the same time, you can be truthful. So, for example, uh, just to give an example, uh, you know, of the of uh, a subject that I have dealt with, Savarkar. You know, he's a highly controversial uh, historical figure, and you hear, uh, you know, uh, extreme views about him. He evokes extreme opinions. You know, he's either a national hero or he's a national villain. He's either a revolutionary freedom fighter or he is a 
person who wrote apology letters and mercy petitions to the British. You know, he is either completely anti-British or during the Quit India movement period, he is depicted as somebody who was a British collaborator. So, what's the truth about Savarkar? You know, what I feel is this sort of this sort of a response. You know, these kind of disparate responses actually make a historical figure even more fascinating. You know, they, they do they do become extremely interesting because why do people look at them in this manner? So the idea is to look at the complete historical personality, you know, with all their gray shades, black, white, gray, all of them, and, and tell the reader a story that is engaging and that is honest. You, have, you, you may bring in your own opinions uh, into the picture, which is inevitable, which is unavoidable, because like the great historian E.H. Carr said, all fact is interpretation, because even as a historian, when you are writing facts or what you believe, what you say are facts, you are choosing those facts. Now, there may be hundreds of facts that, you know, Parvati may have come across, you know, when she was writing about Jahangir or I may have come across when I was writing about Savarkar, but I selected some and wrote about them. So facts are also interpretation. Or when a newspaper writer goes out and uh, goes out to report something, you know, various people write the, their reports in different ways. For me, something will be the introduction, the first paragraph. For Nandini, something else may be the, the first paragraph. That is because we are interpreting an event in a particular manner. So it is a fascinating process. But once approach depends on, I think, I think a lot of intellectual honesty is necessary. And I, for this, I'm I'm not uh, speaking from a position of a you know high moral authority or anything because you know one is constantly struggling with that. You know you know you are critical towards a subject. You know you are sympathetic towards a subject. So one has to be aware and constantly try and be as fair as possible to the subject as well as to the reader because you know you have to give a complete picture to the reader. So it's a constant struggle. And it's a struggle that everybody wages, uh, you know, with his or her own strengths and, you know, weaknesses and ability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, I feel the society that you live in is also very important. You know, for instance, Western society has for a long time been extremely liberal. So you can have a frank and free exchange of highly controversial opinions as well. In India, we have always been a little sensitive. And... Uh, so that sensitivity uh, comes in the way of uh, free and frank expression sometimes. Sometimes a history writer or a historical fiction writer may want to approach certain subjects or touch upon su certain subjects. But if you look, if you, you know, think about the ramifications or the consequences, you might, well, might as well take a step back. So it is a combination of factors that leads to, you know, what one uh, finally writes. Uh, and I mean, there are various considerations that writers may have. Sometimes it is outright fear. And, you know, let us admit that there is outright fear. I think we'll be... I, I just want to add one one more point uh, to yeah. this uh, and my question, which I was planning yeah. to make a second question, but somewhere you are... Sorry. Much Sorry. That. Sorry. So I I just want to add into your... So that you can answer. Uh, when I was reading reviews of Savarkar, I found uh, uh, some very great reviews. Some were actually bashing you. And the very interesting part was uh, all the media houses which did that, they have a reputation of taking a particular side. So do you think there is a popular opinion? And as a publisher, because this question is asked to us also, do you think while writing, uh, this any these kind of opinions actually impact uh, how the media will see, how your all other colleagues will see, what kind of review it is going to get. And of course, the threat, if you are writing about the political person, then of course, yeah. there is another threat. So how much that impact is also, if you can get some detail about that also. I think I think the reviews of uh, the Savarkar book also reveal how, uh, you know, uh, people see him, uh, you know, with, with these extreme positions, you know, so... Uh, if I say a word that is uh, sympathetic about Savarkar, I'm attacked for being pro Savarkar. If I write a word that is critical of Savarkar, then I'm attacked for being anti Savarkar. Now that is that is 
another interesting position that one finds oneself in. And Savarkar is a man of extremes, and he himself is a very complex and contradictory figure. You know, he is a revolutionary uh, hero. Uh, yeah, you know, and I completely disagree with uh, what, for instance, somebody like Rahul Gandhi says that you know he was busy writing apology letters to the British while Nehru and Gandhi were sleeping on the dirt floor of a cell. You know, uh, I do not uh, subscribe to the opinion that, you know, Nehru's and Gandhi's contribution is in any way less than that of anybody else. But I do not subscribe to the view either that Savarkar was, you know, was not a freedom fight. Then there are views on Savarkar's Hindutva. I have certain disagreements with Savarkar on the issue. And I feel that he does take very extreme positions at times. So one agrees with certain things that Savarkar has done, one disagrees with certain things that Savarkar you know, has done. That does not make one pro or anti-Savarkar. So it, it is, it is a, so the, uh, the reviews that you have referred to, they have, perhaps they might have, you know, and, it, and I, I feel that I, you know, I would welcome any kind of review. I'm used to getting bashed. I've even been physically bashed by the Shiv Sena, you know. So, you know, being bashed in print is perfectly all right, far better. So, one doesn't mind being bashed. One does not mind being uh, praised uh, at all. But uh, so long as, as, as the reviewer's approach is fair. But, you know, once views are colored, uh, and that's okay, you know, one has to welcome uh, both, both things. It's just... Yeah, I it yeah, just shows actually how how uh, interesting some of our historical figures are that you know they have started evoking these kind of reactions. I completely agree. And uh, when uh, so we were talking about, I I'm also looking at the clock, so I will speak less and I'll come back to the question. So Nandini, coming back to you, uh, we all talked about till uh, now about historical figures maybe in fiction or non-fiction, but your upcoming book, which is uh, on the animals. So this, how, how do you actually see that, this point of view? Because till now, before, before uh, knowing about your book, anytime when I think about historical fiction or non-fiction, I always think about the figures, about person, but not about any animal. So how, how this different point of view? And is there many more about it? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Um, actually, you know, uh, I love animals uh, and, and I love history. So this, this book was uh, like coming together of the two things that I find interesting and worth fighting for. But, uh, you know, uh, the interesting thing about writing uh, historical fiction, and I would agree with Vaibhav here, that including not just historical fiction, but also narrative history, which Vaibhav and Parvati are writing. The interesting thing is that, you know, it gives you the ability, more for fiction, less for non-fiction, but still the ability to kind of put a camera, you know, on the head of a of a character and, and flip the scenario. Uh, I would here like to refer to one of my favorite historical fiction writers, uh, two-time Booker Prize winner Hilary Mantel. Uh, what she did was she put the camera on Thomas Cromwell's head, you know, and so the whole picture, instead of being looked at through the eyes of Anne Boleyn or Henry, here we are looking at the whole scene through the eyes of Thomas Cromwell. I was trying to do the exact same thing with uh, the Blue Horse and other amazing animals from mm. history. See, you know, some of the characters over here, we've all heard about them. You know, Rana Pratap, Shivaji, uh, Akbar, uh, Alexander, you know, very well-known uh, people. But the, the point is that every time you talk about them, uh, you look at what they went through you know, Battle of Haldi Ghati, Battle of Narai Nala, you know, they're very famous battles. But you look at it from the perspective of the human, the human hero. But the truth is that they, much of what they did in battle would not have been possible without their favorite horse, their favorite mm -hmm. elephant, sometimes a favorite dog, sometimes even a favorite parrot. 
you know, so favorite falcon and so on. So these people kind of remain in the background. They never come to the foreground, but they would have had an equally important role, right? right. I mean, Cheta played a huge role in the Battle of Haldigati. So, so in this book, I had a bit of fun because I sort of flipped the narrative and looked at the same things from the point of view of the animal. Thank you. Thank you, Nandini. Uh, Mapya, coming to you. Uh, I, I was reading in your interview again, again, this question is coming from your interview. You traveled a lot when you were writing about direction by to Ocha. And here I want to sh ask you to, for, for the writers, young writers who want to write more about it, what are what is the artistic process which you follow or you suggest them so that while writing a historical fiction, they can intervene the fictional real character and how much is importance of research is part of it. Even Nandini, when she talks about Chetak and everything, so this somewhere comes through the research because we normally don't think about that part. So how do you uh, suggest any young author who want to write historical fiction? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yep. Okay. So now just, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, taking it up from where we have uh, spoke about, uh, you know, a certain uh, character uh, uh, who you're writing about uh, has been viewed uh, in different ways, you know, interpreted in different ways. Uh, this is um, uh, very interesting. It becomes a little difficult for the writer. Because when I was, for instance, dealing with Rani Lakshibai, there was a controversy about her as to, you know, there was this huge incident uh, where 65 Britons were killed in Jokhanbagh. Jokhanbagh was a huge massacre. Okay. And the British had taken shelter, the women and children and men, 65, 66 of them. And the entire lot was wiped out at one go. Okay, there was no mercy. So there has been a lot of, uh, you know, debate as to what kind of a role Lakshmiya played in that massacre. So now when I wanted to reproduce that in my book, for instance, which is, of course, a, a, as they call it, a faction, a fictional narrative of that event of the 1857 mutiny, I was actually, you know, I hesitated because Lakshmiya is such a revered figure. You know, in, not only in Central India and Jhansi, but if you go all over the country, I mean, you can't mess with her image. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, foreign uh, uh, writers, foreign researchers, who are biographers of Lakshmi uh, Raina Zerosh, she has written in her book uh, that uh, Lakshmi had this, you know, uh, she was a young widow. So she used to tie up her white sari in a very sensual way whenever she met the British delegates, you know. So now, for instance, I actually, you know, I was scared to even touch upon that. Can you imagine a mid 19th century widow who is revered, who's worshipped by her subjects, still date. She is not just a historical figure, she's a cult figure. I cannot write about her tying her sari in a sensual manner to, you know, facilitate uh, the proceedings of a particular discussion and, uh, you know, in, in her uh, in, uh, favor. So, I did not touch upon that, but there are aspects like that. So when you ask, what do you leave and what do you take? So you have to be very careful what Weber said, this is India. We have to be very careful because there are, it's a very volatile country and the slightest disturb can set up. And I do not want to be pushed up, Weber. I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to visit me okay? So I have to be very careful. Similarly, uh, when I wrote Anarkali and Salim, incidentally, this was a play which was written by Taj Imtiaz Ali, a resident of Lahore. Uh, I, 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 I would just add one more question which came from the audience, and because this is somewhere close to this, the point which we are discussing. It is how does one differentiate between enhancing historical stories, taking complete creative liberty? So because you're talking something on the similar sorts, I thought I would just add on this question also. See, that's answer. a creative process. I mean, there are no do's and don'ts there. You pick up a certain incident, a certain event, historical event, and you build a story around it. You add characters uh, the way so that those characters will take the story forward without messing with the actual events. So now, for instance, Taj Ali, when he wrote the basic play uh, uh, on Anarkali and Salim, he was very influenced by the Western prose 
romantic prose, which was the flavor of the season in the West that time. You know, drama. So he wrote about uh, Akbar, you know, being this cruel despot uh, who um, entombed this young girl alive. Now that went, went down very well with the British because this was right post, uh, uh, I think half a century after 1857 mutiny, where the British wanted to give the impression that we are, uh, a, we are civilizing this extremely brutal country. You know, you have brutal rulers like Alfred who are entombing live people, you know, and we are here to civilize the Indians. So it went very well with them. But there were a lot of Indians who did not like this portrayal of Alfred. You know, Akbar was considered a very uh, magnanimous, a very, you know, uh, um, a, a person, a king who was uh, very generous with his mercy. So, Taj Shah Ali was in a fix. So, then what to do? He was a writer as well. So, these are the things we have to grapple with when we are writing. But as a, fic as a writer of historical fiction, yes, uh, we uh, tread on slightly uh, safer ground, I would say. Uh, without messing with the facts, without, uh, you know, uh, doing anything uh, with the facts, keeping those intact, we take a certain, I would, for instance, if any, anything I feel is uh, sensitive, I'm writing a story, I want to give a glimpse of our history through a form of art that is friendlier, that is friendlier, that you can communicate with. My first book, Boka, for instance, is about, is written for young adults about stories. All three books of mine are written in different periods of history. So Boka is in the 1940s, when India was fighting its own war of independence and the world was engaged in World War II. So what is the take of the common man? So here was Subhash Chandra Bose fighting at loggerheads with the International Congress that time. You know, he was the president of the International Congress twice. So what is the take? So what are the children? How are they? You know, the children, the common man then, what was his, uh, you know, feeling, what were his emotions, you know, um, being caught in between these two big battles that were going on. So you have to decide what you want to talk about, how much you want to share, what you want to keep away, and uh, how safe you want to be. So this is a very personal decision, uh, which as a historical fiction writer, I can afford to take. But if I'm writing narrative non-fiction historical stories, I don't think I can afford that kind of luxury to make a choice as to what to say and what not to say. Because there are certain facts which you have to deal with, clinically at least, you know, without getting your emotions involved. So that's that's the way we, we make our individual decisions as writers. Yeah, and whatever we have learned in school about the history, that also makes us like, oh, how they have written this thing, how they played with my character. And coming back to the so school again. Yeah. Unengaging. The history yeah. we have read in our textbooks is not comprehensive, not engaging. And all of us here, that is the very our attempt is to make it more engaging, more communicative, and more interesting, more accessible to the common man, especially the children. So, Parvati, this comment of Mopia brings me back to you. And this is a question which came from audience also. The question specifically for you is, can historical fiction facilitate learning for children? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah no, I would say to that, and if there were to be, uh, yes, I would say all fiction, any kind of reading can facilitate learning for children, uh, historical fiction, definitely. And, uh, and I think I would just echo what I was saying you know, earlier that, uh, that, uh, that an ability to access and empathize with historical characters and to understand that. Uh, that is basically, basically a series of stories that can be understood uh, in you know, different ways, interpreted in different ways, uh, and you know, uh, uh, and at the, at, the, at the base of it uh, can give us both learning and pleasure. I think is something that uh, that will that that will should I mean will be certainly very valuable for children to to to, to imbibe. 
and we in fact got to get rid of many of the problems that uh, the, you know earlier panelists that were uh, on Mopi and all are referring to of this sensitivity or constantly being not to know or am I am I my feelings being hurt for something that being said by someone who did 400 years ago you know why 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 if you, if you feel that you can actually physically and enjoy it and understand it and I don't think that you should always sort of uh, either in awe of it or scared of it so we become far less defensive about it and we are able to talk about you know sort of disengaged uh, uh, engaged but dispassionate uh, uh, manner so I think that we would be here. Thank you uh, Parvati and well, we have our time is over, but we have two questions from the audience, which I definitely want to take. And Anushi allowed us if the we have we can quickly finish it. So, Webhav, uh, if you can just answer it one one and a half minute. Uh, yeah. Question from audience for you is: Does does accuracy of historical facts matter in a historical fiction novel? Though it's about novel, but yeah, if you would like to answer. Uh, yeah, uh, quickly, uh, accuracy of historical facts does not matter in a historical novel or in historical fiction. But what matters is whether the story sounds plausible or not. So the background has to be right. The plausibility factor has to be there. You know, uh, I will give you an example of a movie that was made where one major battle in Indian history was uh, shown on screen. Okay. And the reason the forces that were fighting that battle lost the battle was that the battle was being fought on the plains and not in the mountains. Now, the movie showed that the battle is being fought in the mountains. Now, that makes it completely ridiculous. So, the plausibility factor has to be very much there. You know, yeah. the story has to read believable. You can take liberty with facts. And uh, your your limits as a historical fiction writer, I believe, are, as a reader of historical fiction, you know, are, are the limits uh, placed by your own imagination? You know, you can you can take Im your imagination to whatever lengths you want to, provided the story sounding plausible. You know, it should not sound implausible. But again, you know, like we we you know, there there are no hard and fast rules, like Mopi has said. For instance, you know, if three years ago I, I had written a short story, a fic fictional story, saying that, you know, three years down the line, you know, the Shiv Sena has joined hands with the Congress and NCP in Maharashtra and, uh, you know, and formed a sort of secular sort of government, in single court secular government in Maharashtra. People would, have, people would have called me crazy, but things like that happen, you know. So, so uh, you know, it, it is, it is uh, about plausibility and at the same time, uh, so you can indeed write that story also about the Sena and Congress joining hands, so on enemies joining hands, but then the trigger has to be convincing. Yeah. That, uh, the precipitate, the factors have to be convincing when you're writing a sh uh, short story, you know. So I think, I think uh, a writer constantly has to keep in mind, uh, is this story plausible? Is this story plausible? Or am I going to sound, you know, very, very uh, totally unbelievable and, uh, you know, convincing? Uh, you have to convince the it. So, Nandini, the point uh, which Webhaus said, it should be convincing, the historical fiction should be convincing. And that is the question which came for you also. What are the key elements of a realistic historical fiction story? And I would just request you to uh, close it in one and two minutes. Thank you, Naveen. Um, you know, my favorite historical fiction story is Shorudindu uh, Bandhupadhyay. Is, uh, is, uh, he used to write in Bangla, uh, and he obviously is more better known for Bonkesh Bokshi stories. But he said something very interesting, which explains what we are talking about here. He said in historical fiction, the foundation is history. You're building a house. The foundation is history. But the walls, the doors, the windows, the curtains inside, all the furniture, all, all that is fiction. So at the end of the day, it is a story, but it is based definitely in history. Therefore, like Mopia said, you can't, you know, I can't show Devaraja, Chandragupta, Vikramaditya, you know, driving around in a BMW 3 Series. I can't do that, right? It's a question of getting the middle right, getting the plausibility, as, as Vaibhav said, right, and getting your basic his, historical 
you know the the timeline right within that frame of focus you can play around thank you very much nandini and uh, because the time is over so everyone who is watching i hope uh, this was a good session for you uh, at least i learned a lot and for me it was much better than my history classes so a lot of thanks to learn from the authors uh, so thank you very much everyone who was part of it anushree now it is up to you thank you sir and ma'am for that delightful discussion and i am really sure that the audience was amazed to witness it at me i witnessed it as i was uh, i also thank you publishers penguin india and jagannath for all their help and sgr knowledge foundation for organizing this event i thank personally each and every one of you for accepting this uh, for accepting your the invitation to this panel and actually sharing your knowledge and experiences with us and uh, lastly i thank the audience for attending with us and i hope that everyone has a great evening and uh, yes thank you for joining thank you very much bye bye thank you okay, so. Twenty years of existence two universities 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses rai sony group of institutions a vision beyond